Good morning, beautiful San Diego people. <coughs> Lovely San Diego, so nice to be here. So, are you ready to relax and let your dreams come true? Yes. Good. Then you're in the right place, because that's what we're doing here. We are relaxing and letting our dreams come true. It's a very different uh, way than what is kind of the Western way, which is about forcing things to happen, hustling, running around, striving, struggling, working hard. That is not what New Thought is about. In fact, I posted the other day the definition, because it's, it's so amazing how people brag about hustling now. Hashtag hustle. And really, hustling is lying and cheating. That's what hustling is. If you look up in the dictionary what hustle is, it's lying and cheating. It's pushing and forcing. It's exerting your will and being aggressive. And so there's nothing in New Thought about hustling or being a hustler. It is about relaxing and aligning, that we relax and align. And we're going to talk about that a lot today. Um, and the first thing I want to do is give you full permission, in case no one ever has, for you to be who and what you want to be, to do what you want to do, and to have what you want to have. Full permission. You do not have to seek approval from the board about any of this, and you don't have to seek approval of the religious or the spiritual people who would love to tyrannize you about what is appropriate for you to be or do or have. So that's why I started this morning by saying, what is it that you want to create? What is it that you want to create? This is a very important question to be asking yourself all the time. What is it that I want to create? Because that's what we are. We are creators. So the lesson that, of course, synchronized exactly with everything that we're talking about this morning, <coughs> which was the actual workbook lesson from yesterday, which is let me remember I am one with God, is what all of new thought is rooted in. A Course in Miracles itself, as far as I can see, after 30-some years of studying it, is for the most part hammering away two basic ideas at us all the time, all the time, all the time. Now, A Course in Miracles, the purpose and the intention of A Course in Miracles is the attainment of inner peace. Then everything that the Course talks about are just the path to the realization of that inner peace, which really we already have. But the two things that the Course is always talking about and reminding us about is who we are and who God is. So it's just telling us that over and over and over again, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Who and what we are, who and what God is. And really, once you know that, why wouldn't you have peace? It really is only what religion has done with the idea of spirituality and God that's messed it all up for us so that we might have anxiety over those kinds of things. But when we really understand, just as we read in this lesson, let me remember I am one with God, that there is no other God out there. There's no God out there. There's no, he's not some dude in the sky on a throne with a crown looking down through a cloud at you. There's no such being. You know, there's that old uh, saying, I don't know how it's that old, but it says, if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. Have you ever heard that? If you see the Buddha on the road, kill him, means there's no Buddha outside of you. Don't actually kill anybody. <laughs> but it means that you couldn't see a Buddha outside of you. There is no Buddha outside of you. So you can say the same thing about Jesus. If you see the Jesus on the road, kill him. What it really means is you kill the concept that there is any Christ, any Buddha, any God outside of you. And this is what all of New Thought points to. So I want to read to you <clears throat> what Ernest Holmes says about that. There isn't God and man. There is only God as man. And I am that man now. God and I are one, and God is that one. As I willingly let go of fear, faith appears. As I willingly let let go of the belief in duality, oneness appears. So this was my, you know, I've been studying this so long. I'm kind of a slow learner. 
There are things that I've read for 35 years that then I'll go like, oh. <laughs> oh, that's what that means. Like, that's what that means. So all of the things that I'm going to tell you this morning are obvious things that you've heard a million times and you're probably like, oh, Jacob, you're so far behind the times. But it's still like, you came, so too bad. But my big thing <laughs> recently was letting go of this idea that we have a connection to source or that we have a connection to God and how ridiculous that concept is that we have some kind of connection to God because for anything to be connected, it has to be two separate things. So we can't possibly have a connection to our source we can't possibly have a connection to God because that would imply separation too. This is where Ernest Holmes just said, when we let go of duality, us and God, there's only one. This is the thing that all of the early sort of American metaphysicians talked about all the time was there's not two powers, there's only one. There's not two presences, there's only one. Joel Goldsmith would hammer this home all the time about there are not two powers. And those of you who've been in you know, religious science or uh, the centers, what they're called now, if you've taken classes or been around a while, you'll hear in treatment, a lot of times the, the practitioner or the person praying will talk about there's only one mind, one life, one presence. That's what that means. There's only one. So we must give up all attempts to connect because you know when you're trying to connect, you're thinking too separate. So we want to just give that up and go, do you see how, again, this is about effortlessness? Because there's even effort in connecting. There's no effort in just, there's nothing to connect to. It's always here. It's always here. I just forget. That's all. I just forget. It's not like sometimes the sun comes up and sometimes it doesn't. It's sometimes I have the blinds drawn. That's all. It's still there. It's just whether I'm aware of it or not. And that's why A Course in Miracles says enlightenment isn't a shift at all or isn't a change at all. It's a recognition. So we're just recognizing this oneness that's there all the time, and that there is no God outside of you, which means you get to choose what you want to create. You are the chooser. There's no need to seek permission. You have your own permission. If you need permission, I'm giving you permission right now. You have full permission to be and do and have what you choose. What you choose. I am now officially post everything. <laughs> you know, I talked for a while about being, you know, I, was, I grew up religious, then I became post religious and I was spiritual. And then for years I was spiritual and then I was like, I realized spirituality was just religion and tie dye. <laughs> Same old, they just dressed up the term. So then I said I was post spiritual, but I'm post everything now. I have absolutely no affinity with any group, because all groups are about separation. I'm post-gay, I'm post-American, I'm post-political, all of those things. And it's interesting how the world keeps getting worse at this. <laughs> it's not getting better. It's getting more labeled, more splintered. If you want to see something really funny about that, uh, Rent the Life of Brian by Monty Python. And there's a great scene where a bunch of the, these, this sort of ragtag apostle group who are basically following the wrong guy anyhow, but this sort of ragtag group, there's one, this was, and keep in mind, this was like in the 1970s, and there's one guy who is like transgendered, so he's dressed as a woman, and he's insisting, and they keep calling each other splitters, because instead of just having this group of apostles, they all want to have their own individual labeling. So the one is this, is this guy who's dressed like a woman who calls himself Loretta. And Loretta is having a big fit because she wants to have the right to have a baby. 
And they're going, but you can't have a baby. You don't have a womb. You're not a woman. But I want the right to have a baby. And they're going, splitter. So they keep splitting up on the benches into smaller and smaller groups. And it's all this labeling that we do that is the duality of duality of duality of duality of duality of duality of duality. So in scripture, it says, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ. Then there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And that Christ is God within. It's not a person, it's not Jesus. Christ merely means anointed one. So we're all anointed. So in that anointing, we're all one. There's no separation. There's no Republican and Democrat, conservative and liberal, rich and poor. It's to keep coming back to letting go of all of these separations, all the boxes. This is why we do this at the beginning meditation. We say, start to let go of your labels. Start to let go your race and your creed and your past and your family and all of these things. That's where you'll find your peace. When you get to the place where you're, you know, one of the things years ago, when I first started doing this, a lot of the format of what I did, I patterned after Marianne Williamson, who I had, was one of the people that I studied with early on. So what she did, and I did this for the first 10 or 15 years of lecturing, where I would come out and say, because this is what she did, and I would just come out and say, please introduce yourself to the people around you, in front of you, behind you, to your right, and to your left. And then people would introduce themselves. And then I realized at a certain point, that defeats the entire purpose of us being here. Because as soon as someone introduces themselves, they have to be somebody. You know how you, you have to be somebody. And your real freedom and peace comes from being nobody. Being nobody, because the somebody that you're trying to be, you're always sort of defending and trying to present to people. This is what I want you to think about me. This is how I want you to see me. If I say introduce yourself, then you're going to go into your head right away, because you're going to be, do I like this person? I'm not in a good mood. I'm a germaphobe. I don't want to say it. I don't want to get near them. I don't want to. All your thoughts start kicking in instead of saying, let's relax and let all that shit go. Let go of your resume, let go of your past, let go of all that, and just relax into your infinite self. Now, from there, what do you want to create? What do you want to create? Give yourself permission to create what you want to create. And to, let, to never stop playing. Because that's what we want to create from. You don't want to create from need and desperation. You want to create from joy. What do I want to bring more joy into my life? What do I want to create to bring more aliveness and more fun and more of all that is good as God? Because we just read, you are God. There is no other God. You are God as human, human as God. There is no out there. So what do you want? Stop judging by but what would other people say about that? What would my boss say about that? What would the spiritual people say about that? You know, when I first started in all of this with Terry Cole Whitaker, that was a phrase she used all the time, was be and do and have what you want. What are you being, doing, and having? Decide what you want to be and do and have. And that was something that I think came from Reverend Ike. And Reverend Ike, for those of you who don't know, was an African-American minister, and that was part of his thing, was you can be and do and have what you want to have. So a lot of stuff, he, was, he came to Terry's church one time to guest speak. And <clears throat> Reverend Knight was sort of famous for having all these Rolls Royces. And he had started out as an evangelical in the Christian church and then had basically gone on from that and moved into New Thought and started his own ministry and became very famous in a television ministry. And he was very controversial because he talked so much about prosperity and wealth and, and having all these fabulous Rolls Royces. Well, at that particular time, that was necessary. Particularly, that was necessary for black people. Because when he started, this was like still parts of the country were segregated still. 
So there needed to be somebody who was gonna be the symbol that God wants you to be wealthy. And so he had all this sort of ostentatious things to show that sort of proved his prosperity. But see, we don't need stuff like that anymore. I mean, who really drives a Rolls Royce anymore anyhow? I mean, if you want one, you should have one. But really, for the most part, that was just a sign for people to say, see? But now you really, we don't need anything. Let's talk about what prosperity really is in its essence. This is um, Raymond Charles Barker's Treat Yourself to Life, who was a religious science minister. He was actually the first teacher of Louise Hay. This is our definition of prosperity. Are you ready? See, you got your notebooks out. <laughs> I define prosperity as the ability to do what you want to do at the instant you want to do it. Prosperity, the ability to do what you want to do at the instant you want to do it. Money in the bank is a good idea. A few stocks and bonds tucked away are a fine idea. An intelligent life insurance program is okay. But why don't I define prosperity in terms of money? Because prosperity isn't money. Money is necessary for prosperity, and prosperity will produce it, but prosperity is not money. If you are able today to do everything you want to do today and can do it in the way you want to do it, you are prosperous. If you want to go out to lunch today and you can do it, you're prosperous. That's all it means. It's the ability to be and do and have what you want. It's not how much you have to show other people. It's not how, much, how many cars you can show to prove such and such. Like I said, at that time, that was necessary because he was basically showing. He used to say all the time he talked about, he said, I used to be black until I turned green. Because I realized that was the only color that really mattered in America. It didn't really make any difference about your race. People made such a big idea about race. But what really mattered was your ability to be and do and have what you wanted. So he stepped outside of that limitation, that box of I can't because I'm black and the South is segregated and da-da-da-da. He said, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm stepping outside of that. I'm going to be and do and have what I want. So he had a lot of stuff. But I think later in his life, he didn't have all that stuff anymore because it wasn't really necessary. It was really just about living the way you choose. For most people now, what I really think prosperity, especially to young people now, what I think really prosperity is is freedom. A lot of the young people now do not want to be saddled down with some big mortgage and a big house and a big this and that. They want to be able to travel around when they want to and work from their laptop while they're off in the Ganges, right? Freedom, that it's really about freedom. Well, that's just what we said. It's the freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do it. It has nothing to do with what you have to show to other people whether they approve. It has nothing to do with whether you have enough money saved up to live for da 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 It's about your ability to be free in the moment to live the way you choose. And if you're not at that place at the moment, then the work to do is consciousness work. It's not about struggling and hustling more. It's about consciousness work. It's about opening up the mind to limitless Possibilities, limitless, limitless. Remember our affirmation from the other month, the big things happen as quickly as the little things now. Because we've let go of the idea that there's an order of difficulty in miracles or that they take time. It can happen in an instant, in the instant that you're open to it. If you are able today to do everything you want to do today and can do it in the way you want to do it, you are prosperous. You are as rich as anyone with $10 billion. I learned years ago that I could demonstrate prosperity without a large reserve of money because prosperity is the freedom to do what I want to do now, not in the future or in the past, but now. If you can buy a good dinner today and later go to the theater, if that's what you want to do, then you're as rich as Rockefeller. That's all you need for now, and that is prosperity. The diamond necklace you've wanted all your life, the yacht or the mink coat, you can have that too, and I'll tell you about that. 
If you really want a diamond necklace, you can have it. But before you buy a diamond necklace, find out what the insurance rates on it are and the upkeep. <laughs> it is easier, now get this, this is a killer. <laughs> it is easier to demonstrate a diamond necklace than it is to demonstrate a spiritual state of consciousness. <laughs> this is big. <laughs> it's easier to demonstrate a diamond necklace than a spiritual state of consciousness. That's the real work, is staying in that space, not getting distracted by the voices of the world and then going back into fear and limitation. There are lots of people who have a lot of diamond necklaces who live in fear. Somebody's gonna take Kim Kardashian. Someone came and took her fucking diamond necklace, right? She showed it all on Instagram and someone said, well, looky there, let's drive over there. <laughs> She's showing us her shit, let's go over and give it. Right, now she has armed guards with her all the time, living in fear because it's not true prosperity. True prosperity is the consciousness that says, diamond necklaces, they come and go, that's how I roll, sometimes I got them, sometimes they don't. I had a friend who told me years ago that she heard a lecture in which the speaker told his audience to visualize anything they wanted and they would demonstrate it. She and her friends had chuckled over this and one day she said to her sister, I'm gonna demonstrate a diamond necklace. She did. She demonstrated quite a few other diamonds too but the only trouble was that a disagreeable husband came with them. <laughs> she made her demonstration but it was not easy to handle the responsibilities that came with them. Prosperity is the ability to do what you want to do at the instant you want to do it. How many people have been watching, probably just me, I watch TV so you don't have to. Uh, there's a show on National Geographic called One Strange Rock with Will Smith. Has anybody seen that? A couple people have seen that. So it's really a great show. I'm sure it'll eventually like go on Netflix or Hulu or something like that because it's just in the sort of middle of the season. But if you get National Geographic Channel, it's on there every week. And basically what it is, is it's, and I don't know how many there are, there's maybe like a dozen astronauts. That it, so Will Smith basically narrates this hour-long show. And it's like these 10 or 12 astronauts who have all lived in space for a certain amount of time. So, um, and the men and women and, and people of color. And so it's a nice mix of people. And it's people who've been in space for long months, and people who've been there for like eight days or whatever, but it's them talking about what it's like to observe the planet from that distance and to see what's going on. Now, I've watched a lot of these kinds of nature shows and stuff like this, but it was still things that I'd never seen or heard before that were amazing to look at and to see. Here's a word for you infinitesimal, infinitesimal. So they talk about the f all different kinds of things. The, the one show that I've liked so far the best was the episode called Genesis. And there was just thing after thing in that, a whole show that was just like, wow, that's like freaky. <laughs> but in fact, there was a woman who had posted on Facebook on on the National Geographic page, how upset she was at Will Smith for doing this show because, you know, how dare he lead people into atheism because, you know, it's not, it's not a show about some dude named God creating a world in seven days. You know, it's like showing all of the evolution of how this all transpired. And so she's all upset, da 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 And of course, if you watch it, if you're like us, when you watch this, all you see is God, 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 God. You, you can't see anything else. And to me, it is the most evidence there is that there would have to be an intelligent universe. Because the impossibility of any of this being random is zero. All of the things that had to come together in exact, precise order, like to the second, in all of these squillions of things happening for life to be sustainable, for 
you know, meteor to destroy, destroy the dinosaurs that would allow us to be here, for the amount of water that's here, for all of the things to happen. One of the things that I was completely unaware of, and they showed, you know, video of, the, of some of these things, was, I, I mean, you people probably know all this stuff, because science was not my strong suit. Gossip was really my <laughs> high school. So, <laughs> but the amount of lightning that is happening all the time across the planet. Eight, I think they said 800 strikes of lightning a day. So that when they showed the planet, you just see lightning everywhere. Like you're just seeing constant lightning, just everywhere, all over, just flashes of lightning. And the one woman that was talking, when the woman astronaut was talking about, she said, it's like watching the planet's nervous system. Like, it's so amazing to watch all of this stuff happening. And so when you watch it, you see that it, there's no way that any of this could have been random, just like your life is not random. Nothing that happens in our lives is random. This is everything in New Thought tells us this. Everything in A Course in Miracles tells us this. Nothing, nothing, nothing is random. Everything is your consciousness and my consciousness. Everything, everything, everything. All of it. And so you watch this and you see that even there's no such thing as empty space. Like, you know how you think about, oh, out there in empty space. And they're like, it's not fucking empty out here. Stuff is flying around at you all the time. Like they said, your, your, ship, your ship is being hit by debris constantly because space is just full of shit flying around. <laughs> There's nothing empty about space. It's just like you're being bombarded all the time because there's activity. This is the word, right? This is Ernest Holmes is big on that word, activity. This intelligence is constant, unending activity. So you look at this and you see that this word infinitesimal means nothing. You can just remove it from your vocabulary because it doesn't make any difference. That's why Ernest Holmes would say, if you do a treatment and you're clear, it doesn't matter if the thing that you need is off, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away in darkest Africa with someone who has no technology at all, it's on the way to you. You are bound to come together. This word infinitesimal struck me recently because someone sent me an email, someone who's been hearing me talk. You know, I talk all the time about, over the years I have certainly, about how everything is consciousness and what we let, allow our attention to land on. So I've talked before about how doctors who have some weird specialty where, like, there's hardly anybody studying it anywhere in the world and they're studying some disease <laughs> that's not communicable. You can't catch it. It's some genetic Thing, and they've studied it for 25 years, and then they get that very disease they've been studying. Because you get what you focus on. You become a vibrational match to it. So this woman sent me an article from the New York Times from like a week ago, where this woman, it's just exactly that, basically. It's she's studying some gene that's so fucking rare that the chances of getting it are infinitesimal, because that's the word that the article used, infinitesimal. And don't you know, <laughs> after studying this, her daughter got it. Nothing is random. Doesn't matter how infinitesimal you think it is, it's not random. Our thoughts are creating our world all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Whatever you're complaining about, just ask yourself, why am I creating this for myself? And then stop and don't even look for the answer to that. And just say, oh, well, I've changed my mind. I'm going to create something else. It doesn't matter why I'm creating it. I'm going to create something else. What do I want to create instead? What do I want to create instead? That's all you have to ask yourself. This difficulty I'm having, it's not random. What do I want to create instead? That's it. And give yourself permission to be and do and have what you want and eliminate all hope. Stop praying for one thing and believing something else. 
Don't treat or affirm for something and believe something else. Right? I can't tell times when I've done a treatment for somebody and then they'll go, I hope it works, and I just want to punch them in the fucking throat. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, it's not going to. Because you just completely neutralized it entirely and you might as well not have wasted my fucking time or your breath because it is not going to happen. As soon as you hope, it's not going to happen. You have neutralized it entirely. It is our word, our belief. This is why Jesus, when he would heal people, he would first say, do you believe I can do this? The first necessity for understanding the world in which you live is to understand it on the premise that it is activity. It is never static. See yourself in a fluid universe, a flexible universe that is forever in process of change. At the same time, it is forever dominated and guided by an intelligence which is forever producing new forms, new creation, new experiences. All of these, when seen rightly, are good. That's all I saw on that show. That's all you see, is you see a universe that isn't finished. That's why the idea of like seven days, even metaphorically, is ridiculous, because it's not done yet. It's still not done yet. Nothing is done yet. Nothing is ever going to be done. It is still in the process. The universe is still being created all the time. It is still expanding. There are even still new species of hummingbirds coming in. What the fuck you think? You would think the world would be done with hummingbirds. It's like, no, let's try it this way now. <laughs> right? So I want you to look and see when you think you're done sometimes. What bullshit that is. Call yourself on your bullshit, right? You should be hearing Jacob's voice, bullshit, just like that. We go, oh, my time is up. Oh, I guess it's too late for me. Bullshit! They're still making new hummingbirds. <laughs> Come on, get with the program. <laughs> it's wonderful if you can be clear and specific, but not about how, only about what. Not the way. The way is none of your business. That's what the intelligent universe knows that you and I don't know in our conscious human mind. That's not our part. Our part is what? Do I, what do I want? I want to be married. I want to have a baby. I want to have my own business. I want to be healthy and fit. I want to, I want to, I want to travel to here. I want to whatever, right? It's, and if you, as clear as you can be and still feel good, I'm going to read from this great talk of Neville Goddard's that I love where he talks about this, where he says, it's, it is like going into a restaurant. You don't just, don't just settle for shit. Stop just settling. You would not go into a restaurant and say, what is the chef trying to get rid of today? <laughs> <laughs> what is there too much of? You don't have to say, well, we have too much of the stew. We had it for four days and can't sell it. That's what we're trying to unload. Stop thinking about the chances of you creating what you want. Well, what are the chances given my resources or where I live or how much student debt I have still or, or I'm still you know, trying to get this divorce? Fit? Stop thinking about that. That's just your story of limitation. All right. So. He's responding, actually, to some questions in this. It's a live lecture of his. But anyhow, he says, first of all, I do not divorce myself. Because basically what someone had asked him was, but what about the will of God? That's why I've spent the last months harassing all my classes about the recognition that your will and God's are the same because there is no God outside of you. There's no God outside. The Course in Miracles says God's will for you is perfect happiness, and God's will and, and mine are one. So, that's it. That's all you need to know. There's no God saying, oh, no, you have to live in Ohio. <laughs> 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 
There's, you get to do what you want, right? There's no God out there. First of all, I don't divorce myself from God. God has only one name, and I have that name. I can't point elsewhere to his will. The minute I say his will, I'm divorced from God. So I ask myself, what do you want, Neville? Are you asking yourself what you want? Now, because the whole vast world is yourself pushed out, you aren't going to injure anyone, but you can't deny that you still desire. You want something, so you want it. Well, you assume that you have it, and then you let things happen. If it takes 1,000 or 10,000 to aid the birth of the assumption, then they will be used, and they will be used either knowingly or unknowingly. But if I have to wait to say, is it God's will? I'll wait forever. I'll wait forever. Is it God's will that I should pay my rent or be thrown out? Well, then if I'm going to wait and say, well, I'll let him tell me, because some friend will say, you know, you need that experience. You need humility. You need to be thrown out of your place. I've had it. I don't need to learn the same lesson twice. Oh, I've had that. When I thought that God was out there and God's will allowed him to do it and I just sat and did nothing, then came the end of the month and I couldn't pay my rent. And the landlady says, you know, I can't carry you any longer. Out you go. I've had that experience by waiting for God to tell me what to do and he never told me. I had to do it. And so when I got married, I knew I had an obligation to life. I had another life. Then came a child and I had another one. It's my obligation, but to have some external being tell me how, no, I know. Put her through school, all right. Do you want to go to college? Okay. Then it's my obligation to put her through college and I did, but if I waited for some external being to talk to me and say, maybe she shouldn't go, it would be easier on you. Then I'm passing the buck. The whole vast world passes the buck. No, my dear, make your decision. Even if you're wrong, make a decision. Okay, then you'll learn from it. But to be undecided so that you will not make a mistake, well, do you know that story? It's in Revelation. So then he quotes Revelation. Would that you were hot or cold, but because you are neither hot nor cold and you are lukewarm, I spew you out. Right? You're neither here nor there. People in New Thought today are too wishy-washy. They don't want to make a decision. Don't be wishy-washy. Make a decision. Then work with the decision. Sometimes you make a decision, and then you, that's how you know it was not the right decision. Some people sit on the fence for 20 fucking years. Do you ever know those couples that were together, wishy-washy, for 20 years about, oh, we don't know. Maybe we'll get married. Maybe we won't. Then they, they've been together 20 years, they get married, within a year they're divorced, they never see each other again. Because they didn't know till they got married, oh yeah, this is not it. Because they're just wishy-washy. I don't know, I'm afraid of commitment. What if it ruins? I don't know what to do. Do you think I should open my own business? I don't know, what if I do this? Just fun. There's a section in The Course in Miracles called The Branching of the Road. And it says, there's nothing more miserable than standing at the branching of the road and not deciding which way to go. And it says, if you make the decision with this inner being, right, with the God within you, then it says, even if you go in the wrong direction, you'll be brought around to the right direction. You'll be brought around. Because that's how consciousness operates. If you're doing it from, that's why we always meditate and pray first. We do the mystical before the metaphysical. We make that awakening to, that's right, there is this divine presence, God, in me that I am. Nothing can change that. Nothing can diminish it. Nothing can harm it. I am infinite spirit. That's my ground of being. Now, what do I want to create? Instead of going, what do I want to create? Now I'm going to go to the wisdom within. No, because you've probably said what you want out of human fear and lack. We don't want to create out of human fear and lack because whatever we do is infused with the consciousness and the vibration that was in, it, in us when we created it. So if you're creating money out of, it's like, 
Joan Rivers, I always talk about her, she's a perfect example of this because she lived in a poverty consciousness while living in a place that looked like Versailles. She had all this tremendous wealth and she lived in fear all the time that it was gonna be gone if she didn't have a gig six nights a week. So if you watch the documentary of her life, you'll see how here she is, like in her, the last years of her life, living in this palatial <laughs> place with all this money and instead of enjoying it and just like going, isn't it amazing, she's all talking with her secretary about all the empty boxes on her calendar where she doesn't have a gig. Why don't I have a gig? I don't matter, I don't mean anything, they're forgetting me, da 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 da, all this fear. If you're creating from that, you can create, in, there are, the, this country is full of enormously wealthy people who have a poverty consciousness. Because they're constantly living in fear that it's going to be gone, that they don't have enough, that they have to keep making more, that someone's gonna take it from them, that they have to protect it all the time. That's not abundance. So we don't want to create from that place of lack. You don't want to create a relationship out of loneliness. You've never been as lonely as you are when you're with somebody and lonely. A Course in Miracles, there's a, there's a lovely line in the Course that says, under a common roof which shelters neither in the same room and yet a world apart. Isn't that happy thought? But people have that if they're creating from a knee, I desperately need somebody, I'm so lonely. What you want to do is create relationship from joy and love and overflow. I have so much and I want to share my life with somebody who also has joy and wants to share. That's how you want to create, from that joyous place, not from that lackful place, right? You decide, oh my God, I'll get a mate and then finally I'll have someone to take to things. Oh, we can go to the parties together, we can go to our family reunions, we can go to the holidays. So you create the relationship out of that and what you end up marrying a fireman who's always on call and never can fucking go anywhere with you. You've never been so fucking alone. Because now you can't even flirt at those places. Right? You create from joy. You create from abundance, right? From the fullness of your heart. All right. <laughs> you know those people, you can't make coffee or tea with lukewarm water. Let it be hot or cold. Let man be intense. You know the people who oppose me and say, Neville, I think you're a nut. I think you're as insane as they come. Well, I've been told that time and time again. Those who really oppose me become my best students. But those who come and say, oh, I think you're wonderful the first time they hear it, they never come back. Well, those who say, I think that man is insane, I've had them. On 49th Street in New York City, I came upon two ladies. Now, I've heard this story before, so he doesn't tell it completely here, but he was at a bookstore window and they didn't see him. He was behind them, so they didn't know that he was standing there. And they had his books in the window. So this would have been back in the 1960s when he lived in New York. One lady was showing her out-of-town friend all of New York City, and a big picture of mine was in the window with all my books. And the one woman said, do you know who he is? And she said, no. Well, he is the mad mystic of 48th Street. You've got to go and hear him. You've just got to go hear him. He is mad as a hatter. We all go to hear him because he's so insane. It's fun. She said, it's fun to go and sit down. It costs you nothing. In those days, it was all voluntary giving on their part. And so 1,000 people would come three times a week to hear the mad mystic of 48th Street. But those who heard and thought, now he is really insane and would challenge me, they would become good students. Those like the two on the street who said, oh, he's a mad mystic, go and have fun. They never became students. They loved their little icons and they prayed to their little icons and he never answered them, but they kept on praying anyway. Right, that's, do you know, I hate to say, I shouldn't say this because I don't know what's going on. In, all the New Thought churches, but I was so shocked that there's a religious science church in an area near where I live that we're taking a group to go see John of God. You know, John of God who does the faith healing, who does the, you know, it's basically all that crappy fake stuff where you pull a chicken liver out of somebody and say you cured their disease, right? So I'm like, 
what is a New Thought Church going to see fucking John of God for? You might as well have a big statue of Jesus and Mary on the stage. It's like the power is in you. The power is in you. We have... That's all. Okay. <laughs> now, this killed me too. My dear, I believe in being as specific as one can be. I just know that I want, that what so often I wanted certain things and wanted it in detail, and I got it. Now, if you cannot be specific, all well and good, then just take sort of an overall feeling. But if you're very specific, God is very definite. Now, get this. This is. This just was another thing that just fucking shook me to my core after all these decades. God, so God, the universe, is very specific. It's very definite. Outline is perfect in God's world. Now, what's different in what he's talking about outlining and what we talk about outlining in New Thought, they'll tell you in New Thought or in Religious Science, don't outline. But what that means is don't figure out how. But you can be as specific as you want about the what. So you can say, I want to get married to a man who has a good sense of humor and is loving and is open-minded and spiritual and has good character and da 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 But don't outline how, right? Like, and I should meet him at da-da-da-da through friends or da da Like, that's not your part. Don't outline the how. So he's saying it's perfect, though, to outline the what the content of the relationship. I want it to be fun, and I want us to travel together, and I want to, you know. <clears throat> so he says, outline is perfect in God's will. Look at the thumbprint. That's how specific the universe is, that your thumbprint is different than every other thumbprint in the world. But get this, I never thought of this before. Not only a man's thumbprint differs from all thumbprints, but his odor. I never thought, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Because otherwise the bloodhound could not find you. That's how different your smell is. It's so different that a dog could find you next to someone who smells very much like you, but isn't you. That's how specific the universe is. You see how that word infinitesimal is meaningless then? It's meaningless because that's really the only way that God within you does shit is specifically, highly specifically God in you. I don't say God much anymore. I say God in me. God in me. The God in me is highly specific, very definite. Just imagine three and a half billion of us and no two have the same identical odor. No two have the same sound to their voice, similar but not identical. I'm just continuously blown away lately by how simple all of this stuff is. Wildly simple but like, gun, 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 gun. like it keeps going down, 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 deeper and deeper down to see how I can let it be easier. I've let it be pretty fucking easy. And I can let it be even easier and easier and easier. And it really comes down to permission. You give yourself permission to be and do and have the life you choose. And that in order to do that, you have to embody it. You have to live in that vibration and live in that frequency. That's why people thought that Neville was crazy, because he said, and I love this, <laughs> here's the answer. Now, I've been in New Thought since, more or less, since 1983. I've tried a lot of things. Everything. Terry had a plethora of shit for us to do. And, and I came up right when there was a huge burgeoning of all this stuff. So in the time that I was with Terry Cole Whitaker Ministries, like we, there were all kinds of things you would do, like the, what was the S training, which is now like Landmark Forum. 
10 sessions of rebirthing, 10 sessions of body work, which would be like Heller work or Rolfing, past life regressions, screaming into pillows, therapy, we all had to go to therapy, see a therapist and talk about understanding your child and all this kind of stuff, affirmations, writing, tapping, like all kinds of shit, everything there was to do, did everything, did the Course of Miracles, did everything, everything, everything. I can honestly say not one fucking thing worked ever or made the slightest bit of difference except this Neville stuff. And do you know what it is? Pretending. <laughs> That's basically all it fucking is. It's pretending. <laughs> you just pretend that that's how the universe is set up. As a man thinketh means as you, as you pretend in your mind. That you, you know, uh, um, one of the things that Cary Grant used to say, because his, I can't remember his name, was Reginald something, his real, his birth name. And <clears throat> he was raised very poor um, for most of his life without his mother and he ended up running off and joining the circus and become a circus performer. And then from being a circus performer, he ended up being in plays. But because of the way that he looked, he, they started sort of putting him in these leading man roles. But he was anything but that as a person. So that near the end of his life, you know, because he was so revered as such a, just a class act. Like, what was classier than Cary Grant, basically? And he said... <clears throat> then people sort of would want to be like Cary Grant and be like, you know, we all sort of want to have that sophistication. Da, 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 da. And he said, listen, I played Cary Grant so long I became him because that was not who he was inside. But he played it until that's who he was because that's it. You are who you say you are. Okay, this is what I've been saying in class. I'm going to say this a lot. This is the most important thing I think in your life is what are you saying to yourself about yourself? What are you saying to yourself about yourself? Because what you are saying to yourself about yourself determines what you manifest and how you feel. Your joy, your peace, all of that. What you say to yourself about yourself has more power than what anybody else is saying about you. A lot of people are looking around for somebody to believe in them. Why the fuck would they? It's not their job. It's your job to believe in you. And when you believe in you, then you will attract other people who will believe in you. But until you do, you will just attract other people who don't believe in you either. And if you come across people that believe in you when you don't believe in you, you will reject them. You will sabotage it subconsciously. You will fuck it up. Years ago, I'm going to tell, this is such an embarrassing story to tell. <laughs> but I've made peace with it. <clears throat> Many years ago, like, this has been like 1993, maybe, something like that. And I had, I started lecturing in Santa Barbara in the summer of 1990. No, in November of 1990. So I've been lecturing for several years, and we had gone through to where I had built up from like 12 people on a Saturday morning to where we had hundreds of people on Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings. By this time, I had moved to Venice. And I was driving up twice a week from Venice to Santa Barbara. So I'd drive up Tuesday nights and give a talk. And then I'd drive up Saturday morning and give a talk. And at a certain point, it was just too much. And I didn't want to do it anymore. I wanted to just do the Tuesday nights and not go up on Saturday. Because I wanted to have, because my life was, I was very lonely. And one of the things was that during the week, everybody was at work. So there was nobody to do anything with during the week. And then on the weekends, I was driving fucking up to Santa Barbara. So I wanted to be able to have my weekends free so that I could do things with my friends because I really was just so alone. 
So I made the announcement on a Saturday morning that, okay, I'm gonna end the Saturday mornings and just do the Tuesday nights. And this couple came up to me that I knew since, since that they had come to that first little group with 12 people. And they were um, a pretty well-to-do couple who lived in a, in a like private community in Montecito behind gates. He was a stockbroker who'd made a lot of money and then they had moved to Santa Barbara and he was still working as a stockbroker. Um, and they, then the rest of the time they would travel. And they had in fact, that's the, the only time I've ever been to New York, they took me to New York. And they, we went to New York City and they took me to a Kenneth Wapnick retreat and all this stuff. So they came up to me on this Saturday morning, very upset and said, because they didn't come on Tuesday nights because he was getting up, he would have to get up so early because it's three hours earlier in New York when the stock market opens. So he would have to be up so early. So 7.30 was like fucking midnight to him. So they would come Saturday mornings. So they were very upset that I was ending these Saturday mornings and said, please don't stop coming up on Saturday mornings. Here's what we would like to do. You tell us how much money you want to make. We'll pay the rent. I was lecturing at a theater at that time, Victoria Hall. They said, we will make sure you have enough money for the theater to pay whatever salary you want and Robert will start to invest money in the stock market for you so that you will have a portfolio. And of course I said no. <laughs> right? So I know what I'm talking about when I say this stuff. How if you don't believe in yourself, then even if someone comes and believes in you, you will not take the opportunity. First of all, my first thought was, I don't want to be responsible to them because now they have too much power over what I'm going to do and what I'm going to say and all of that kind of stuff because they're giving so much money. So I didn't want that. Secondly, I didn't even know what, I had too much fear because I'd been working for myself, because before I started lecturing and working for myself, I had always worked at little office jobs where I basically made like around minimum wage. So I didn't even know how to go in and negotiate something or to say to somebody, I think I'm worth this much money or even want to say an amount. So I just said no. Now, of course, if something like that happened now, now I, I believe in myself enough to say, okay, great, and here's, how it would, here's what I would like to do. Like, you can't say what I can talk about or say I need to do this or need to do that, and so we would work all of those things out. But do you understand what I'm saying? That a lot of people think, oh, I wish I had an offer like that. If you are not in a place in consciousness, you'll fuck it up. And you'll have a good reason. And I don't regret that at all because it's put me in the position now to be able to say what I want. And I've had plenty of experiences like that. It's very easy for me to attract unicorns. I'm a unicorn whisperer. I attract unicorns all the fucking time. Like, I don't worry about all this petty little 1111 stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Kindergartners can do that shit. Oh, I saw the clock, it said 1111. Oh, I saw the clock, it said 555. That's just, who cares about that fucking bullshit? I'm a unicorn whisperer. That's how I know I'm in alignment. I went, you know, I talked to you last month about, I think I was here, did I talk to you about Starbucks and getting chased out of Starbucks by the homeless guy? This homeless guy was gonna kill me, basically. <laughs> and I realized, it's time to leave this Starbucks. Because it's a very low consciousness, low vibration place in the mornings when I go. Because I go so early, it opens at like 4.30. So when I'm there at like 5 or 5.30 in the morning, it's mostly people who are homeless and mentally ill. So, and there's a lot of meth people and stuff like that. And so, at least once a week, the cops are coming in and dragging somebody out because they're doing shit. So, I'd known for a while that I needed to find a higher consciousness, higher vibration place. But it was like, well, they have the Wi-Fi, and this place doesn't have Wi-Fi, and this, it opens at the right time. So I was dragging my feet. So you know, like you drag your feet. You know you're supposed to go. You know you're supposed to do this. You know this isn't good enough for you anymore. You know you've outgrown this, and you go, just one more. So then the homeless guy comes up and he thinks I'm somebody else entirely because he's upset about how I threw him out of this place that I don't work at. Like he thought I was at some 
There's a place in LA called the Greystone Manor or Greystone Mansion or something that people can rent for events and there's and it's like blah, blah, blah. And he thought I worked there and threw him out. So he came over and said that he was gonna kill me for blah, 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 and was in my face. And then he said he was gonna wait and get me alone. And so I was like, this is probably the end of Starbucks. <laughs> Cause like, I'm not willing to get a black eye to fucking sit here and use their Wi-Fi in the morning. So, <laughs> so that was the last time I've been there, and that was, you know, a month ago or so. And so I just started trying new coffee places. And so, um, and there was a place in my mind that I had been to like two years ago. I had walked by on a walk uh, during the day, and then I could never quite remember where it was. So I wanted to go back to it, but for me, I don't know why, Third and Beverly in LA are the same street to me, even though they're not, but they are simply because they border the Beverly Center. So like one street is the beginning of the Beverly Center, one street, so, I could never, so I could never remember if it was on Third or Beverly. So now I had a reason just to try out coffee shops. So I'm wandering around in the morning, tried this coffee, that coffee. So one morning I went to a place, got in there, and that was totally not it. So I was like, I'm going to see if I can find that other place. So I drive over, there it fucking is. Da, 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 da. I walk in, it's very early in the morning. There's hardly any, there's just like the people working in there and maybe two people at a table. And I walk in and I get an Americano. I was getting an Americano. They only have one size of Americano there, so I was like, Americano. So they call... Jake Americano, and look over, and it's Jake Gyllenhaal. And I'm like, unicorn! <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's how I know I'm supposed to be here. No fucking 1111 is going to tell me I'm supposed to be here. It's Jake Gyllenhaal. This is my place. <laughs> two Jakes, two Americanos. So, <laughs> so, this experience that I had years ago with these people. So I've had lots of different experiences where people wanted to do things, and a lot of times I would let them, and then a lot of times I wouldn't let them. But it was, it's all based on your own, what are you telling you about you? You are setting, write this down. How do I value myself? How do I value myself? In all my areas of life, how do I value myself? Because you're setting kind of a price on yourself in different ways all the time based on how you value yourself. It doesn't matter what the market values. There's somebody doing what you do making 50 times what you're making at it. Regardless of what the market will allow based on what they tell themselves about themselves. You know that, right? So, just change your value. Stop telling the story about how, well, I don't have enough education, or I need to know that tonight, and I'm too, I'm too old now, and it's not in this town, and we don't even care anything. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> and change your value. How do I value? My self. You know what I have on my bulletin board now? Three words. How many people here work for yourselves? Self-employed. Lovely, a lot of people. Okay. So there's three words I have on my vision board. When I wake up in the morning, I see my vision board because it's right next to my bed. So it's got pictures and then it's got some, aff not even affirmations, but just little phrases and things to just set my day off in the right way. Because what you're doing is you're only ever impressing your own subconscious mind. That's all this is. That's where God is in your own subconscious mind. So you're always just impressing these things in your own subconscious mind. So I wake up and I see these three words, generous billionaire donors. <laughs> now you might change that to generous billionaire clients or customers or whatever. Generous billionaire donors. So I looked. Do you know there's over 2,200 billionaires in the world? You only need one. You're not being greedy. 
All right, there's still plenty. I'm working now on my first $100,000 donation, right? By working on it, I mean I'm just expanding my mind to that, to see a donation come in for $100,000 with no strings attached, no instruction, no nothing. That's it. You just open your mind to that. That's what pretending is. You just see it. That's the pretending. That's the Neville way. That's why we were taught by Terry Cole Whitaker a million years ago, act as if. That's all the lunch game is, is you acting as if. I would suggest to anybody here, if you've come with friends or you have friends who are interested in these things, that you have like a dinner party. Just a small, intimate dinner party where everybody comes as themselves like five years from now. And you totally speak in the present tense of whatever you want to be living five years from now, and everybody just agrees that that's true. Regardless of anything. You just live in that state, and you spend whatever, an hour or two hours at dinner, being in that conversation, in that reality, dressed that way, bring props. There was, you know, Jack Canfield talks about doing this in some seminar that he was in years ago, and the teacher had them do this, but I think they did 10 years or something like that. I mean, you could pick whatever amount of time you want. It doesn't, it's irrelevant, the amount of time. You could do six months from, it doesn't make any difference. Um, but the, it was a small group of people, and they really went for it. Like, there was a woman who was an actress, and she hired people to stand outside, because they did it at a restaurant. She hired people to stand outside, and she put a red carpet out, and people who photographed her and asked for her autograph and shit. Like, it was that real. And Jack Canfield came as a, you know, New York Times number one best-selling author millionaire. Duh. Think that worked out for him? I worked at Chicken Soup. I don't know how many of you know this. I worked at Chicken Soup offices one summer. Just, it was the only job I've ever had since I started doing this full time in 1990. And for a very short period of time, one summer, for just like two months, I worked as an assistant to Kim Kerberger, who, was, who is Jack Canfield's sister. And this was at the Chicken Soup offices in the Pacific Palisades. It was a little office, and they had all the books there and stuff. And by this time, you know, it was just great. I mean, they just shit these books out. Like, <laughs> chicken soup for the this, <laughs> chicken soup for the that. Like, like, seriously, like just, and they would sell like gangbusters. And basically, by this time, they weren't doing that much other than editing them. So Jack Canfield and Mark Vincent Hanson weren't even writing stories for the books a lot of times. It was just all the other people writing them. And it's just like a money factory, basically. And so that's what they do. So the 101 story, 101. So one of the things that they did in these offices was just find the letters that they were going to use in the book and then edit them and content and all this stuff. But I'm looking at the books and I'm like, and all the books, if there was a famous author who was writing it with them, because so, sometimes there'd be a main editor author. So it'd be like Barbara DeAngelis, Chicken Soup for the Romantic Soul, and it would be Jack, Mark Victor Hansen, Barbara DeAngelis. And, I'd be, and it'd be pictures and the pictures. And I'm like, God, the, you know, Jack and Mark Victor Hansen look the same in all these pictures, like they're the same thing, because they're like standing one on here, this side, and one on this side, and then the author's like sitting in the middle. I'm like, they look exactly the same in all of these. I said to Kim, they look exactly the same in all these. And she said, it's a cardboard cutout. The author just comes and sits down in the middle of the cardboard cutout and they take a new picture. They didn't even show up for the fucking picture. So do you understand the power of pretending? He's just at a fucking party pretending to be a millionaire author and he doesn't even write the fucking books that he's making millions of dollars off of. Do you understand? <laughs> the power of consciousness, alignment, and believing. Of believing it. That's how much he values himself. That's the story he tells to himself about himself. Are you willing to pretend?
Do you know that there are people who would hike up the fucking Himalayas, take a trek and practically starve to find some master off in the freezing Himalayas and risk life and death, would rather do that than sit at lunch and pretend. Because that's too fucking weird. Right? No, that's how stupid Americans are. Because there was a great story about, <clears throat> I think it was, I can't remember who told this, but told a story about some Indian guy who came over here years ago who was like a, a really big deal guru. And so all these people came, like hundreds of people came. It was, I think, in LA somewhere, because that's usually where that shit happened. So it was like in the 70s or something, and he came. And his whole teaching was, you are the infinite self. You are the infinite self. You are the infinite self. And all these Americans were like, what the fuck is this? We get all this way, he paid for him to come here. He's just this bullshit. You are the fucking infinite self. And the guru couldn't understand it. He's like, well, this is the you know, most profound truth there is. And he was told, Americans don't want to do anything easy. It has to entail suffering and hardship. So the guru comes back the next year and starts this whole five-level hierarchy teaching where the first step is like really horrific, like you have to meditate six times a day and you have to do prostations and you have to, you know, like sacrifice your sex life and you have to do this and all these things. And you keep moving up higher and higher. It takes a long time, like a couple of years for each level until you get to level number one, which is you're the infinite self. <laughs> right? Because you have to suffer and struggle and be miserable in America for anyone to believe something is real or it's worth something. You can't just say, well, it's really just, you know, it's really just what you're believing, right? The thing that you're making minimum wage at, somebody else is making $100 million a year at because they believe something different. That's basically it. I mean, you can, you can see this evident all over the place, especially in this country. You can see that the people who work the hardest most of the time make the least amount of money. The people who are riding around on buses and coming and cleaning people's toilets and raising their children and living in a place, you know, in a bad part of town are making the least amount of money. And oftentimes, you know, there's somebody who just gets up every morning and wonders what they'll do with all this fucking money. Well, it's just a belief system. It has nothing to do with earning or worthiness or deservability or any such nonsense. It really is just your consciousness. Do you believe you deserve a loving, wonderful relationship? Don't tell me about your age and your weight and your this and your that and your herpes and your da da da. I don't fucking care about it. It's just your fucking story. Doesn't mean a fucking thing except you're using it to limit you and stop you. And somebody else is a petri dish. And nobody cares and 10, 15 people are trying to marry them every fucking day because of what they believe. And they got one eyeball hanging out down to here and they <laughs> smell bad and people are fucking fighting over them. I grew up around this, I've seen this. I've seen, this is so amazing to me. I've always said, I shouldn't say this, this probably sounds sexist. Maybe it is, I don't know. But the difference, certainly in the straight community, is that so many times you will see, this is a judgment I know, but you will just see some worthless, just garbage man being taken care of by some amazing fucking woman who, who like, he just sits around in that fucking trailer all day long with his one tooth, <laughs> drinking beer after beer after beer, won't move a fucking muscle to do anything while she's off being a nurse, you know, using her degree and working double shifts so that she can run home with his new six pack of beer and he can say, where the fuck were you? Right? Why is that? Well, it's very simple because that woman looks in the mirror and goes, I'm getting older. No one else is going to want me at this point. I've put on this weight. He's looking at that one tooth and going, yeah. I have still fucking got it. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the only difference, is what the person believes and says about themselves. It has nothing to 
do with, what, with the objective reality. It's what the person is saying to themselves about what they deserve. The woman is thinking, this is all I can get, this is all I deserve. And the man is thinking, she's not good enough for me. But since I can't leave the house, I guess I'll just have to make do. Of course, now that doesn't even matter anymore. He probably just gets women to come over from the internet now. Right? But it's all consciousness, consciousness, consciousness. All right. So let's, well, let's read a little bit about this pretending in the Neville Reader. So first we'll start with this from his little book, Out of This World. Let me again lay the foundation of changing the future, which is nothing more than a controlled waking dream. Number one, define your objective. Know definitely what you want. So we talked about that. Two, construct an event which you believe will encounter, you will encounter following the fulfillment of your desire. Something which will have the action of self-predominant, an event which implies the fulfillment of your desire. So you can do that by visualizing. That's a great way to do it. Or you can do it as I was just suggesting, like a dinner party. That's what I call the lunch game. Zan and I get together and have lunch, and we pretend it's six months from that day, and we just talk about how everything has worked out perfectly, but we never talk about how because we don't know how. We don't outline the how that it happened. We just say, isn't it wonderful? I was so worried about that debt. And then it just got paid off just in the most natural, normal, easy, wonderful way. And then she'll go, I know, it's great. And that's it. Because we don't know how it would happen. And then six months later, don't you fucking know, that's exactly what has unfolded. The power of pretending. I know it sounds insane. That's why I'm the madman of Southern California. <laughs> I love it. I love being crazy. <clears throat> Three, immobilize the physical body and induce a state of consciousness akin to sleep. Then mentally feel yourself right into the proposed action imagining, all the, um, all action, all the while imagining that you're actually performing the action here and now so that you experience in imagination what you would experience in the flesh were you to now realize your goal. So that's any pretending image. You can just be pretending that you are in the south of France. You can be pretending. You know, before, before John came and said, I want to take you to Italy, I had, and I wasn't doing this as a deliberate visualization at all. But I had watched these two things about Italy, and because my whole thing is just living in what feels good, for like a week in my apartment, I was pretending, particularly in the mornings when I get up, that my apartment was overlooking a piazza in Italy. And I was having like imaginary conversations in my mind of looking out the window and what I would see out there and, you know, talking to people down there who were neighbors because I was spending the summer there and blah, 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 blah. And don't you know, within a year, I was in Italy for the on a plane for the first time in 17 years. From what? Pretending. Pretending. All right. <clears throat> Experience has convinced me that this is the perfect way to achieve my goal. Now, I'm going to try and read this quickly here. The Four Mighty Ones. The Four Mighty Ones constitute the selfhood of man or God in man. Write that down. God in me. God in me. The four mighty ones are four different aspects of the mind and differ from one another in function and character without being four separate selves inhabiting man's body. We can best understand the four mighty ones by comparing them to the four most important characters in the production of a play. The producer, the author, the director, and the actor. In the drama of life, the producer's function is to suggest the theme of a play. He does this in the form of a wish such as, I wish I were successful, I wish I could take a trip, I wish I were married, and so on. But you don't have to use that word wish. It's just be, I want to create, you know, you're the producer. You just be like, I want to get married. I want to be debt-free and financially stable. I want to be healthy. I want to, you're, the producer suggests the theme of the play. 
But to appear on the world stage, these general themes must somehow be specified and worked out in detail. It is not enough to say I want to be successful. That's too vague. Successful at what? However, that first mighty one does suggest the theme. The dramatization of the theme is left to the originality of the second mighty one, the author. In dramatizing the theme, the author writes only the last scene of the play, but this scene he writes in detail. Because you don't know how, so you don't write any of the first two and a half acts. You only write the closing scene of the play in vivid feelings in a vivid feeling of the end result, of, you know, stepping on the scale and it just says, perfect weight. <laughs> That's all, just a perfect weight, <laughs> right? Or you just open your checking account and it says $100,000, right? It's just the, and it's short. Make it a nice, short scene. Right? You could be in a wedding tux or dress, and s you don't really see yourself doing it so much. He'll talk about this. You, s you are not seeing yourself because you are yourself. You're seeing other people because you're looking out of your eyes. You have to be in the scene feeling the scene. So you could be in your tuxedo, your wedding dress, and you see someone walking up to you and saying, congratulations. End of scene. Curtain comes down, wild applause. <clears throat> the scene must dramatize the wish fulfilled. He mentally constructs as lifelike a scene as possible of what he would experience had he realized his wish. When the scene is clearly visualized, the author's work is done. The third mighty one in the production of Life's Play is the director. The director's tasks are to see that the actor remains faithful to the script and to rehearse him over and over again until he is natural in the part. This is why <clears throat> you want to feel not excited. You want to feel nonchalant, like it's perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal that I would be getting married today. I'm joyful, I'm filled with joy, but I'm not excited with that thing that says like, this is unnatural and a fluke. By the time you're gonna, you get married, you won't have won someone in a contest. Do you understand? <laughs> like, you'll be happy about it, but you won't be like, I can't believe this is happening, it's overwhelming. Like, it'll be normal, like we've been dating for a while, we talked about this, we've been engaged for a while, we planned the wedding for a while, or we drove to Vegas, or whatever it is. Like, it'll be like, you'll be joy filled with joy, but you won't be like, oh my God! People who are like, oh my God! at their wedding often don't stay married. Right? It's more like, yeah, of course, this is a normal, now of course I would get married, I'm a fucking catch. Why wouldn't I? I mean, if you want to get married, it would be just like, you know, of course I'm not married, I'm too much of a catch. I can't just let one person have all this. Right? What, it's your choice. You get to choose. I give you permission to have what you want, to be who you want, right? So it's just being in that state, of course, there's a $100,000 donation with no strings attached, of course, because I've been working on consciousness for a while, and that's what it's worth. You know, because I'm going to be able to put this out that much more. Like, I have, it's, it's not just random, like, the things have to make sense to you, right? Like, I know what I want to create. I want to have an office in Los Angeles where I can have 20 or 30 students come. I want to have my own condo. I want to have, you know, videos that I can show all over the place. And so, like, it's not just like, oh. It's like, you know, I want resources to do more of the being, doing, and having that I want to do joyfully. And I want to do it all easy, more easily than what I'm doing now. Make it feel good to you. I want it to be automated shit. Because we live in that age now where shit's automated. Right? People can just, you know, the way I write books now is so easy because I'm not dependent on anyone. 
I don't have to have a resale license. I don't drag my books around and sell them. Even though they're basically self-published, I don't have to answer to a publisher or an editor. I can say whatever the fuck I want to. I load it up onto the website and Amazon sells them. And I just take the checks. They're not even checks. They just go automatically into my account. Right? Now I'm doing the work of writing the books, but I don't answer to anybody. I don't have a staff. I don't want a staff. Some people would love to have a great staff. I don't want any fucking buddy around. That's why I don't let anyone come clean my house. I'm like, I don't want anyone fucking around in here. I don't want to have to leave while someone comes and does this shit. I don't want a secretary. I want a, like a virtual secretary. You know, you can have virtual secretaries. Right? So have it the way you want it that makes your life easier, not more complicated and complex. Not more of a nightmare not more overwhelming. That's why you shouldn't design how. Right? Because the infinite intelligence, when you see how the infinite intelligence created the universe, then you go, I think I'll acquiesce to that. Right? When you realize just the, what they say, the infinitesimal percentage that human life would be able to be formed and created on this blue marble and have existed this long and you go, what the fuck am I doing running my life? How ridiculous. I'm just the architect of the blueprints. Then I hand it over to God in me and say, go for it. Go for it. Then my job is to say, okay, to align with it and say, okay, instead of saying, no, no, right? Oh, we would like to pay you a salary and pay the rent on this place and put money in stocks. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> right? That you're ready to go, okay, okay. And here's what, you know, would work for me is that I'm going to continue to come on Saturdays and do what I do, but if I decide, like they were big Course in Miracles students, and then I was like, well, then that's going to mean I can't talk about other stuff because they really just want to hear about the course. So now I would just say, okay, but I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Right? So if you're going to do this, you're going to do it with no strings attached, and either one of us can say at any time, it's not working for us anymore, and we part no hard feelings. Right? Okay. The director tasks are to see that the actor remains faithful to the script and rehearse him over and over again until he is natural in the part. This function may be likened to a controlled and... Listen, here's another thing. Natural in the part. <clears throat> you know, um, Joan Collins. Do you know that Joan Collins was not really Joan Collins until Dynasty? Until she started playing that part on Dynasty, she was not that person. Because I mean, do you know she, Anthony Newley? The actor, she was married to Anthony Newley. And had a child with him. And they were basically just working actors. She had been under the contract system with MGM and all of that. But she was not a big star at all, really. Because I remember like her being on the Merv Griffin show, like. Be, this was before Dynasty, and to them talking about how somebody had run into her in the unemployment office in Los Angeles getting her check because she had not been able to work for a while. So she was somebody who got unemployment, lived like in Santa Monica or somewhere like that with Anthony, and they were sort of working actors, and they got divorced, and she was just like, it wasn't until she started to play Alexis Carrington that she became this grand dame that we know now who lives on fucking caviar, right? What? Because she moved into that consciousness, and she played it so much that it became her dominant consciousness. And she, you know, like that same thing, like with her sister, who wrote all the novels, you know, Hollywood Wives, you know, all that. Was They lived in that make-believe world until it became real for them. I mean, her, her sister, Jackie Collins, was just writing trash, basically. But it was trash about famous fucking millionaire stars. 
so that that was saturating her consciousness all the time because she had come out to live with her sister Joan. She was the younger kid who basically came out to live with her actress sister. And so she started meeting these famous people and shit, but she wasn't anybody and she was not writing great literature. She was writing crap that you read on the beach, right? That you love. But she so imbued herself in that consciousness that it could not help but manifest in her outer world. All right. Natural in the part. This function may be likened to a controlled, consciously directed attention, an attention focused exclusively on the action which implies that the wish is already fulfilled. The form of the fourth is like the son of God, human imagination, the actor. The fourth mighty one performs within himself, in imagination, the predetermined action which implies the fulfillment of the wish. This function does not visualize or observe the action. This function actually enacts the drama and does it over and over again until it takes on the tones of reality. Without the dramatized vision of fulfilled desire, the theme remains a mere theme and sleeps forever in the vast chambers of unborn themes. The four mighty ones are the four quarters of the human soul. Years ago, when I first started lecturing in Santa Barbara, I was about a, a year or so in. And I start, and it was growing, and it was, which kind of scared me. It grew fast, and it kind of scared me, and it seemed sort of overwhelming, and there were things about it that I loved and things about it that I didn't love. But there were still other big things I wanted to do. And one of the things that Ernest Holmes talks about all the time is entertain big ideas. Don't just piddle around with little stuff all your life. Entertain larger and larger concepts of life for you. So one of the things, and these were all things that were dreams of mine that I thought would be fun. Sometimes they were fun, sometimes they weren't fun. But they were things I wanted to do. One of the things that I wanted to do was do Easter service at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. Well, I mean, you know, I could barely, I was living in what was, I'm almost certain that it was a converted tool shed. <laughs> almost positive it was a converted tool shed. And even though I had a lot of people coming to lectures, I was like Neville, because then I didn't charge. It was just a suggested donation. So people gave sometimes nothing or next to nothing. So even though I had hundreds of people coming, I wasn't really necessarily making that much money. But here I was wanting to speak at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. So what do you do? You speak it. Right? This is Genesis, right? In the beginning, you know, God says, let there be light, and there was light. So the universe is spoken into existence by our word. So in one of these lectures in Santa Barbara, I just said, I would love to someday do Easter service at the Santa Barbara County Bowl because it's such a beautiful space, and it'd just be great. Well, I mean, just like that. It manifested, but it didn't manifest until... I was seeing this hypnotherapist in Santa Barbara, and I don't know even, but it obviously was right around the same time, because I talked to her about this idea of doing, now first of all, you have to remember, this was in 1991 or so, and it was a different world then. And Santa Barbara, for as hippie-ish as it is, is a very conservative area. And I had this huge group of people where I was openly gay and we had lots of people coming with AIDS and I was say, talking the way I talk now, the language that I speak now, which all was very, it's out there even now in places. You can imagine what it was like in a conservative town like Santa Barbara in 1991. And so in my mind, there was always that sort of fear of somebody's gonna kill me. I'm going to be out here somewhere, and particularly if I'm going to an open-air place like the Santa Barbara County Bowl, and I'm just going to start saying all this shit that I say, it's like somebody's going to shoot me. Now, at the time, I'm going to tell you two stories about that. At the time, there was a woman, I was working part-time for that first year at Child Protective Services for the county of Santa Barbara, and there were 
and I was just working a couple of days a week typing court reports for the social workers. And so, and there were most of the people who were there had been there for fucking ever. And they're, so they're all civil servants who are like dead inside. You know, <laughs> which, you know, I, I know some social workers who are not, but these people were, a lot of them were just, had been ground up into dust by the system and were dead inside. So I was telling this woman who'd been there, this had maybe been her only job she'd ever had. She'd been there a long time. And I was at the point where I was making as much money lecturing as I was in that part-time job with social services. And I was trying to decide, should I just stay here at social services forever and just lecture on the side like I am now and not really go for it, but just have these little classes and forget about doing anything more than that? Or should I quit this and make this really what I put my attention on and to just have, have it grow as much as it will grow? So I remember talking to her about this one day and she, was, she couldn't see why there was any confusion about it. It's like, if you get it, just get the fuck out of the county. If, what are you doing here if you have something else you can do? And so, but my concern, what I was trying to say to her was, well, you don't understand because you're, you know, you're just, you're a normal person. Here I am, this gay guy in this conservative town with all these people around me with AIDS and I'm saying fuck and all this stuff while talking about God and people get very upset and I get horrible letters and all this stuff. And so I said to her, so my decision is not like yours. You know, you're just, a, you're a straight woman who the world is like not paying any attention to of like you're an outrage and a blasphemer. I'm thinking about, there are people who hate the fact that I live on the earth today. And so I said, so my choice is, do I stay here where it's safe and just do this on the side and keep a low profile and not really get out there in the world and do big things like the Santa Barbara County Bowl and stuff, just teach these little classes at Unity and then come here and or do I let all that go, get out into the world, and then have some asshole come in and blow my brains out? And she seriously looked at me and said, don't you think really that's the better option? <laughs> Don't stay at the county. Let them kill you while you're doing something you love. <laughs> Don't be here with me <laughs> 20 years from now. So <laughs> that was the one thing. Then, so I'm seeing this hypnotherapist to work through some of this stuff. And so she had me stand up and have the body language of being on stage at the Santa Barbara County Bowl, which I did. So we did this process. She's doing this hypnotherapy on me, and I'm standing there and looking and seeing all the people and owning the consciousness of that, the vibration of it, resonating with that vibration. That's what he's saying here. Stand in it, do it, go to the place, look around, act as if it's happening to you right now. Be on the stage at the Academy Awards, accepting your award. Do whatever, be standing at the head of the church, getting married. Be at the bank, accepting the money to open your business. Be standing with the realtor as they hand you the keys to your dream home. Do these things physically. So, just like that, Somebody comes up to me, <laughs> I shouldn't even say this on, when it's on video, but it's too late now. <laughs> but I don't even remember exactly, I guess it must have been a friend of his, or maybe he was coming to the lectures, but at that time at the Santa Barbara, well, still, I guess. But if you've ever been to the bowl, there's a house where the restrooms are or were, there's a house on top of it where a caretaker lives. And so that's, where this person lives. Well, this person said to me, why don't you just come? I'll just let you in. So we used the Santa Barbara County Bowl on Easter mornings for free for years, probably five or six years. Of, now, they, I wasn't sneaking in because the bowl knew. Like the people who run the bowl said, you can come in, but you can't advertise it. So you don't have to have anything then because we're just going to open the gates and turn on the power and you come in. You can't do it till 11 because we can't have amplification because it's a residential area till after 11. But just come in, put up your stuff. You, we can't advertise it because it's a county thing and if you do, then you have to pay insurance and you have to have, um, there have to be 
trucks that will bring handicapped people up the hill to da 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 da. You have to all the things. But if you just do it strictly by word of mouth, and you just we'll just open the gates and let you in. So we came in. My friend Leslie, who would sing at the lectures occasion, she brought her whole fucking band and the sound system. We had a big fucking concert every year at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. Kenny Loggins came. All these people came every year, and we didn't pay a dime. Why? Unicorns. I know how to do the unicorn call. I'm a unicorn fucking whisperer, right? I've told the story, I won't tell it again today, but about speaking at the, <laughs> at the big theater with Marianne Williams. I rented this big theater, the biggest theater in Santa Barbara, because my dream was to speak at the Arlington, which is 1,700 seats or something like that. And you know, at best, I had maybe 200 people who were coming to hear me. And I just mentioned it at a lecture, and somebody made a call, and they said, oh, well, we're setting it up, and you just have to, well, but this I had to pay for and get insurance and all this stuff. Well, I didn't have any insurance, and so a couple of weeks go by, and I get a call from Marianne Williamson, who had moved to Montecito by this time, and she said, my lecture on Christmas Eve in Los Angeles, I thought it was all booked, but my, the guy who works for me, who does all that, passed away in the fall, and no one knew he didn't do it, so I don't have a place to be on Christmas Eve. Could I join you? Well, this was the same time she was on Oprah, with Illuminata, which just came out. So I was like, yeah, you can come over. <laughs> what the fuck, come on over. So of course, she had insurance, so we used her insurance rider. So because everyone knew her, we got on radio stations and we got all of this press and stuff. So we had a fabulous, huge event at the Arlington. Because why? Unicorns. I'm not settling for no fucking 11-11. Okay, <laughs> I want to see a unicorn. That's how I know, oh, I'm tuned in, tapped in, turned on. Unicorns. But that's a consciousness, right? So everything is about what do you want to be, do, and have now? Do you give yourself permission to create that? And to create it from consciousness. To not work harder and struggle more and suffer more and get more planning and strategizing. It really needs to really change what you're saying to yourself about yourself. What am I saying to myself about myself? Here's another thing. Oh, I love this. I keep telling this to everybody, all my groups. I'm not sure where I heard this. I just heard this recently, though. But I love this phrase, vibratory affinity. Vibratory affinity or vibrational affinity. The moment you have an idea, you have vibrational affinity with whoever is on that same frequency. So whatever resources you need, whether they're good or bad. So if you have an idea that you're worthless and you don't deserve much, you, have, you immediately have vibrational affinity with people who will show you that you aren't worth much. If you have an idea of, I would like to speak at the Santa Barbara County Bowl on Easter morning, you immediately have vibrational affinity with the people who can help you make that happen. If you say, I want to speak Christmas Eve at the Arlington, and you have no money and no connections and no resources, you have immediate vibrational affinity with the people who know how to do that. But then you have to keep tending to your vibration and being in alignment with it. So I want to read from this little Ralph Waldo Trine book, In Tune with the Infinite. Are you out of a job? Let the fear that you will not get another take hold of you and dominate you, and the chances are that it will be a long time before you will get another, or the one that you do get will be a very poor one indeed. Whatever the circumstances, you must realize that you have within you forces and powers that can set into operation something which will triumph over any and all apparent or temporary losses. Set these forces into operation, and you will then be placing a magnet that will draw to you a situation that may be far better than the one you have lost, and the time may soon come when you will be even thankful that you lost the old one. Recognize working in and through you the same infinite power that creates and governs all things in the universe, the same infinite power that governs the endless systems of the world in space. This is why 
I'm recommending to people that if you can, that you watch that show on, National Ge on the National Geographic channel, One Strange Rock. Because when you start to see the, how all of this happens, when you see it from space and you hear them talking about it, you get, that's me. All of that, I am the universe. You get that? That you are the universe? That the universe is not something outside of you? That you are like a wave on the ocean? You are the ocean. The wave is the ocean. It's not, a diff it's not like, well, I can't see the ocean because of all those waves. No, the waves are the ocean. You are the universe. You get that? So when you start to see it all coming together, you see it's a perfectly choreographed dance. Even what looks like random chaos is purposeful. It's deliberate and purposeful. And you want to get that, that's me. I'm not a separate thing out here trying to make shit happen and prevent bad shit from happening. I'm part of that whole cooperative thing. And what's happening is just what my thinking is. I'm getting in the stream of whatever my thinking is. That's all. If I'm thinking abundance, limitlessness, health, joy, peace, love, then that's the stream I'm in. If I'm thinking limitation, scarcity, pain, sorrow, that's the stream I'm in. It's a cooperative choreographed dance. Recognize working in and through you the same infinite power that creates and governs all things in the universe, the same infinite power that governs the endless systems of world in space. Send out your thought. Thought is a force and it has occult power of unknown proportions when rightly used and wisely directed. Send out your thought that the right situation or right work will come to you at the right time in the right way and that you will recognize it when it comes. Hold to this thought, never allow it to weaken. Hold to it and continually water it with firm expectation. You, in this way, put your advertisement into a psychic spiritual newspaper. A newspaper that has not a limited circulation, but the one that will make its way not only to the utmost bounds of the earth, but of the very universe itself. It is an advertisement, moreover, which, if rightly placed on your part, will be far more effective than any advertisement you could possibly put into printed sheet, no matter what claims are made in regard to its being the great advertising medium. Of course, now people think that that's social media. All of these things that have happened in my life have had nothing whatsoever to do with social media at all. When I started teaching, there was no social media, there was no internet. Everything was word of mouth. And everything is pretty much word of mouth now. My social media presence is less than that of cats who have a web page. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are cats on Instagram that have a million times the amount of followers that I have and clicks. No one is paying fucking attention to my social media, my advertising, my website, all of these things that the world tells us you have to have in order to have a viable business. You have to have this and you have to have that and you have to have this and you have to have that. You have to have this outfit and this thing and this website and these business cards and this da 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 and it doesn't mean shit. We are on vibrational marketing. Vibrational marketing. Because you don't just want everybody coming anyhow. What you want are the right people coming. Right? I worked years ago in um, department stores. And I worked on commission. Well, you don't just want a whole lot of customers. You want the right customers. Because if you get a customer who comes in and buys $1,000 worth of merchandise today, and then a week from now they re fucking return it all, then you have really wasted your time, and you've probably already spent that $1,000 commission that you're not getting now. Right? So it's not just about getting attention and getting this and getting that and getting that. You want it to be the right ones so that it is a match to what you really want. That's vibrational marketing. That's the real growth that lasts, that's not just, well, I had this one hit, and then that's been it, and I've been trying to get it back ever since. Right? So that's not what we want, all right? 
I, you know, <laughs> I don't know, if you've been coming for a while, you know uh, how much I love Turner Classic Movies. And about a year or so ago, Robert Osborne passed away, who was really sort of the, the face of Turner Classic Movies. He was the guy who was, had been the moderator of Turner Classic ever since it started in like 1994 or whatever, and he passed away last year, which really devastated me. It upset me more than people that I know dying because it was like I had more of a relationship with him because every day at five, I would sit down with Robert Osborne and he would talk about the history of the movie and all this, and he was a very elegant, older dude. Also, something to remember about him is even though he'd been working as a like journalist pretty much all of his life, that didn't happen until he was 62. So nobody knew who Robert Osborne was until he was 62. So if you're thinking like, oh, if you don't make it by such and such a time, he became a wildly beloved icon well into his 60s because it even took a while for Turner Classic to catch on and be shown everywhere. But he passed away, and if you've ever watched Turner Classic, they have, at, when he was on all the time, they would have like people who would come on and pick out movies to watch every week. So like Drew Barrymore would be on maybe every Saturday for a month picking out movies and would sit and talk with him and stuff. And so Cher is one of those people. So I had tweeted the other day, um, she had post, it was his, it was Robert Osborne's birthday. So they had done a whole day on TCM of like interviews with him and stuff about Robert Osborne and stuff. And she had tweeted something about why don't, which I had said like, even before he died, when he was sick and he was off for a while, I had written Turner Classic a couple of times and said, why don't you have one night a week where you show his old, him introducing movies? Because we all love him and we want to see him. We don't care about these other fucking people you have on. Why don't you show it one night of him? Because he was showing old movies anyhow. Who cares if the introductions are old? So, and he's giving us all the history. Why don't you do that? So I'd written him several times about that. So on his birthday, Cher tweeted that. She said, why, are they, why don't they have a night where we see him all the time and da, da, da. So I tweeted her and I said, I know, I said that a year ago when he was sick. And she fucking tweeted me back. So she said, I know, why do we have all these people who just read cue cards? We want Robert. And I was like, unicorn. Okay. <laughs> so what am I saying today? Consciousness, consciousness. Conscious. What are you aligning with and thinking? Are you being diligent about your consciousness instead of allowing the world to hurl you into activity? We want to think activity of consciousness and then physical activity later. But first, the activity of the universe. All right, I'm going to make you say some shit. Repeat after me. I give myself permission, give myself permission. To, be to be what I want to be, to do what I want to do, to have what I want to have. I want you to say that to yourself every day for a while. I give myself permission to be who and what I want to be, to have what I want to have, to do what I want to to do and to start coming from a place of creating instead of wanting. Instead of thinking about what do I want, let that maybe be a jumping off point, but think more in terms of what do I want to create. What I want is still too passive and it's usually thinking about two powers. I want something and something might give it to me. But if there's a God in me, then I'm just thinking about what do I want to create? What do I want to create? I want to create vibrant health. I want to create energy. I want to create more wonderful friendships. One of the things, you know, is I started getting definite about things. This is one of the, I don't know if I talked about this here or not, where I said, I want more metaphysical law of attraction friends. I want people who are into this stuff so that our conversations are about this stuff and not about whining and complaining about stuff and how the world isn't fair and they don't like Donald Trump and the government's doing this and what's happening out there. I don't want any of those bullshit low consciousness conversations in my life anymore. I'd rather just be alone. 
I want high vibration, high consciousness conversations about what's going well, what I love, what's great about life, what I'm going to create next, what are we going to do next, what's the next wonderful thing we're going to do, and just supporting each other in that. So start getting specific about what you want, not what you, wouldn't it be nice if somebody would give a lot of it? No. Get in the place of, this is it. This is my dream. This is my vision. Do you know how much of my time is spent visioning? Oh, my God. You do not want a teacher or a spiritual leader who does not spend the dominant amount of their time visioning. The dominant amount of their time visioning. You don't want somebody... That's why churches a lot of times have an administrator. The head person shouldn't be administrating shit all the time. They need to be visioning. They need to spend most of their time visioning growth and expansion. Not money. That'll be part of it. But the vision has to be, what are we doing here? What's our message? What's the vibration? What's the consciousness? What's next for us? So that's the same in any business. If you're the head of a business, you should spend most of your time visioning. The dominant amount of your time should be in visioning and delegating the rest of that shit. That's why it's great that we live in a time when there are things like virtual assistants and, and, and even interns that you can be training to come into the kind of business that you're in so that you are letting go more and more of all the minutia of figuring shit out and all the distraction of that and spending more of your time in what's the vision? So I, you're the leader of your life. Did you know that? You're the leader of your life. You're the leader of your life. So you should be visioning your life. Do you have a vision for your life? I, oh, I should be finishing. I'm just not. I'm sorry. I'm almost getting there. One of the things I decided that in, I decided, say that, I decided. I decided. You need to make decisions on a regular fucking basis to be deciding stuff. I decided <coughs> that I was going to switch my Saturday morning lectures in Santa Barbara to Tuesday nights. Because one of the things, because Santa Barbara's different than here, and um, when I was doing weeknights here, people don't want to drive out here. They'll come on Saturdays because there's not traffic and stuff, but at nighttime, it was hard to get people to come out here um, every week because of the traffic and all that stuff getting out. But Santa Barbara doesn't have any of that. And so I did Saturday mornings for a long time because I was living so far away, I needed more time to get there. But now that I'm living in LA, I'm closer. But there were a lot of people who came in Santa Barbara who wanted to come on Saturday morning because they wouldn't drive at night. So they were older people. And so what I noticed was, as I was looking recently was, well, a lot of those people are gone and a lot of them have died. And it's so interesting because there is a difference. You can tell there's differences in groups and mentalities and the way things are. And I realized that in a lot of ways, for a long time when I was doing those Saturday mornings, it was a lot of older people who just wanted to be fucking left alone. Like, just come in and make us feel peaceful and tell us about the peace stuff of the course. But really, we just would like to wind down to get ready to die. Right? And I don't give a shit about you if you're getting ready to die. Let the dead bury the dead. I don't care about you if you're on your way out. Good. That's fine for you. I don't care about people who are on their fucking way out. There's a whole lots of places that are prepared for you if you're on your fucking way out. I'm interested in lively people who have goals and intentions and want to fucking live no matter how old they are. So the older people now that I have in Santa Barbara are like that. They're not like, well, I'm 70, so I'm winding down. They're like, I'm 70, and I want to go to Italy with my grandchildren, and I want to hike the Alps, and I want to, and I want to open this side business, and I want. That's what I'm interested in. People who are alive. So we're moving to Tuesday nights because a lot of younger, vital people won't come on the weekends. And I don't mean younger like 17. I mean younger like 50. You know, because they, on Saturday mornings a lot of times, are doing their laundry and getting the groceries because they work all week and all that kind of stuff. But on a Tuesday night, they'll come because it's after work and there's, let's face it, there's nothing going on in Santa Barbara on Tuesday night <laughs> or Monday or Wednesday or Thursday or usually Friday either for that matter. But, but it's that starting to look at what is it that's going to bring you more life? 
So you, if you decide that you're going to up your vibration and up your consciousness, then it's going to mean making some choices, deciding some things, and some things that might be risky, and some things that might be scary. Like making some decisions of, I'm going to have to let go of this friendship because I'm not lifting this person up, they're just dragging me down. I'd been hanging in there thinking I could bring them up or I could just listen with not out judgment and da da. And what's happening is they're just bringing me down. And I want high vibration, high consciousness relationships. Right? Does that, does that make sense? All right. So if you're getting ready to die, you're welcome to keep coming, but be a vibrant dying person. Be someone who's living right up to the very end. I want to go out like, wee, like that. <laughs> like a, wee, it's the, there's the tunnel. <laughs> oh, there's mom. <laughs> All right. Okay, and here's another one. I'm not going to leave till I've told you everything. You can leave any time you want, but I'm not leaving till I've said everything I've come to say. This was another great realization. I realized I cannot tell a victim's story and be a creator. I cannot tell a victim's story and be a creator. Because those two neutralize each other. They basically erase each other out. So if I'm going to tell a victim story on any level about how they weren't fair, they didn't this, da 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 da, I can't be a creator in that same episode of time. I have to be one or the other. So if I'm going to be a creator, then I've got to just drop that story. No one's interested anyhow, by the way. People are hoping to fuck you, don't tell that story again. <laughs> The greatest day of your life will be the day you start to tell it and think, I don't have the energy to finish this. It's even boring me. Right? Okay. <laughs> oh, here's the other one. I just got this one this week, too. You know Malachi, in Malachi, where it says, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not be able to hold it. You know that? It's basically about tithing, if you bring your tithes into the storehouse. Here's what I realized was, I open the windows of heaven. If you're God, you're the one opening the windows of heaven. So when you just make that switch of every day saying, I am opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing onto myself so much that I will not be able to hold it all. You are now, again, not waiting for something out there to do something. You're the one opening the windows of heaven. You're not giving, and then there's a God that opens the windows of heaven. You open the windows of heaven. Everything in New Thought is about stop waiting for something to do something. You're the one. I am opening the windows of heaven and pouring out blessings onto me. There is no God outside of me to bless me. I am opening the bank vault and pouring out blessings. I am loving myself. I am being there for myself. What are you saying to yourself about yourself? And then our famous sort of way to sort of catch it all when the mind goes into that place of where you do start to figure out how, then we just use our affirmation, lots can happen. Lots can happen. Like, I've put you, I've told you, okay, so I have on my bulletin board there, generous billionaire donors. But that's just one of many, many ways that I can be prospered. I'm only doing these things as exercises to expand my own consciousness. I have no attachment to that at all. Could be a million, I could win the lottery, somebody could leave me money, somebody could all just of sudden, millions of people start wanting the MP3s and sending me money. I could, there's just a limitless amount of ways that money could come pouring, might not even be money at all. Might be somebody says, I have this office space in Los Angeles that nobody's using, I would like to give it to you to use for five years for free, do whatever you want with it. 
Right? Somebody could say, I have this condo that's been sitting empty for years, and I would just love to have somebody live in it, so I'm just going to sign it over to you. Just There's no limit to the ways and means through which the universe can, through some infinitesimal <laughs> way, you understand? So we want to be in that state where we're just saying, well, lots can happen. All that's really matter is I'm at the end scene. The person's handing me the keys to the condo. I'm walking into the office that I've turned into a classroom and every seat is full. I'm all that, that's my part. My part is just rehearsing over and over again something that feels totally joyful to me, not stressful at all, not overwhelming, not like too much, not like I've settled. You understand? That you're not going into the restaurant and going, what do you have too much of? What have you been trying to get rid of? I guess I'll take it, I might as well. I'll have a banquet of crumbs. Right? You say, this is what I want, this is it. Now, how you make it, that's up to you. I'd like it well done. I don't know. How you make it well done, that's up to you. I'm not coming back into the kitchen and going, that's not the way. <laughs> right? I'm just, this, I want the spaghetti, I want the whatever. Okay? All right, I think I've hounded you enough, and I didn't even read to you from Love and the Law. But now that I got it out, I will. <laughs> it's just a little part. But it's so the same thing. <laughs> the human race has tried to, this is by Ernest Holmes, Love and the Law. The human race has tried to make God a king. It is not unusual to, pick, to see a picture of God even in our day of generation. I've seen a picture of God in a newspaper. God is turning over the pages of a book and reading the history of the human race. When you think that there are 1,000 million suns and God only knows how many planets, God could not be a man reading a book. We've got to get over these little concepts and begin to provide a bigger realization of the universal. We must not deny that which we affirm. If there is a power that can hold everything in its place in the universe, that power is enough and we do not have to look to any human aid for anything or anybody. You and I reason only from cause which is spiritual and mental and we begin to use this light. So what we've got to do is to weed out from our thought everything that denies us. It denies it. There is something in the race consciousness that says we're poor, we're limited, that there's lack of opportunity, that times are hard, prices are high, nobody wants to spend money, and so on. They are all of them a mistake and have got to go. Never a person succeeded who thought that way. We are using the power destructively and we do not even know it. Every thought like that must go and every individual must realize that he or she is an active center of the Lord God Almighty. Enjoy that supreme intelligence from the absolute. We are given dominion over everything. We must speak forth what we believe and not what we do not want. That's it. Let's pray. That was on page 125 of Love and the Law. And if they don't have this in the bookstore, they can order it for you, as with all of these books. All right, let's pray. Let's relax and let our dreams come true. So once again, close your eyes, take a nice deep breath. <sighs> relaxing and together now we enter the theater of our minds and the stage of our imagination so standing on the stage of your imagination set the scene the director suggests the theme of what is desired, what is to be created. That's the producer. The director is then rehearsing the actor so that you are in the scene at the very end, realizing that dream coming true. What do you see? The author has written it very simply. It may just be one or two lines. Here are the keys to your new home. Congratulations. Your body is cancer free.
keep relaxing and breathing as we release this scene now to God in us, the only God there is, this inner kingdom where Jesus told us we would find the kingdom, not out there, not in the sky, not after we die, here, now, this inner kingdom that as we dwell in this inner kingdom, all of these dreams will be added to us in the perfect timing, in the perfect ways. We don't design how. We know that lots can happen. We have limitless resources. We have become and achieved a vibrational affinity with all the people, the timing, the resources, the activity has already begun. The molecules are dancing. Everything in this living universe, this living multiverse, is now being orchestrated for our greater and greater good, and we align with it. We know we don't have to deserve it or earn it, but we do have to believe it. Do you believe? Do you believe? Now tell yourself, God in me is my manifesting power. God in me is my joy. God in me is my health. God in me is my wealth. God in me is my loving companionship. And so we release this prayer treatment now to God in us, knowing that this or something even more wonderful is now manifesting and unfolding in perfect timing, in perfect ways for the greatest good of all concerned. And so it is. And so we let it be. Amen. I want to stretch a little bit. All right, thank you so much for coming. Go out and enjoy this glorious, wonderful, fabulous day in this living universe. <laughs>